Hello, and welcome to the 2019 CIO virtual event, Accelerating Mainframe Modernization. My name is Laura Loxmano with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have a few administrative details to share with you, and then I will turn things over to our esteemed speakers. First, we'd like to thank RSD for their partnership with today's event. They've been a wonderful thought leadership partner to Argyle and are committed to providing, with e providing you with valuable content and the overall great experience. So thank you again to RSD. We appreciate you joining us today. We welcome you to stay connected today during today's virtual event. You can follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum and be sure to join our LinkedIn group, CIO Forum. I also wanted to take a moment to touch upon our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on feedback we've received over the years from our members. Argyle is very proud and protective of this policy as it reflects our commitment to ensure the neutrality and overall value of the content presented at our events. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. Finally, and most importantly, please submit any and all questions that come up during today's event in the Q&A section of the interface. Following the panel discussion, we have set aside some time for our speakers to weigh in on your questions. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Craig Hilburn, Technical Account Manager with RSD, as well as Mark Perillo, Technical Account Manager at RSD. We're pleased to have Craig and Mark join us today. So Craig and Mark, over to you. Hi, this is Mark Perillo from RSD. Uh, I work with Craig Hilburn. Together we'll be doing this presentation. Uh, Craig? Good afternoon, Hi. everyone. Hi, I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'll be starting the presentation is funding modernization with reduction in mainframe spending, and we're featuring a step-by-step -step approach to optimize and modernize the mainframe. Okay, on our agenda, we're going to start off by talking about the uh, mainframe state of affairs, what's happening in the mainframe universe at this time. And after we discuss that, we're going to move on to the urgency that is present to drive mainframe modernization what we uh, call modernization is actually uh, maximizing efficiency and using our resources to uh, make the mainframe a better platform, more cost-effective, more reliable, uh, more in tune with today's needs. And then we feature a step-by-step -step approach to uh, affect this modernization and to use as a guideline and as a format uh, going forward. So the mainframe state of affairs. What do we know about the mainframe today? Well, at RSD, we've recently attended many Share and Gartner events, and there are several sessions that have been included on the mainframe processing capacity and directions going forward for mainframes globally. IBM found that fully 80% of critical corporate structured data resides and is processed on the mainframe. And then Gartner shared the results of their mainframe survey that was sent to their customers for research. 76% of the respondents indicated that current mainframe capacity would remain steady or grow over the next three years. And additionally, they noted that there are over 1.5 million transactions processed per second in the mainframe worldwide. With this level of processing and capacity, some of the current challenges facing the mainframe can be significant as well. The mainframe is a critical and reliable component of the business infrastructure and has some challenges. Controlling costs remains very important. In our modern world, the mainframe can account for up to 40% of the IT budget, and as such is a very viable and frequent target for reducing costs. However, in proposing an across-the-board budget cut or trying to cap the resources from the mainframe are not really an effective uh, solution. 
capping itself is inorganic and neglects the needs of the business, it actually tends to prolong the processing and uh, potentially jeopardize your SLAs just to stay under a certain uh, processing peak. And migration off platform may be a solution for some of the applications, but that requires unique challenges as well, particularly since a lot of the applications that are resident on the mainframe are there for a reason, either security, or, uh, reliability, redundancy, or transaction speed. And moving them to another platform can be pretty complicated if you want to get all those uh, services as well. As Gartner reports, the IT and business partnership is in a critical state. It needs attention and development, and it also presents some challenges to cost control. Adding to that, the fact that the workforce supporting the mainframe is shrinking and mainframe expertise itself is becoming scarce. There is pressure for continued security, efficiency, reliability, and some innovation going forward. The mainframe still has a very important place in today's world. And heightened SLAs and continued challenges for a 24-7, 365 environment continue to press on. The world never sleeps now. Everything is uh, instantaneous and things roll around the world. And the mainframe is a big part of that. Critical processes and challenges are factors in the cost of the mainframe. We said before it can be up to 40% of the budget, but the cost model for the mainframe is kind of unique. It has a monthly licensing charge concept, which is based on a subcapacity reporting tool from IBM, and people pay based on the rolling four-hour average in a month, the highest single occurrence in that month. This uh, charges for not all components, but many components. Previously, people used to uh, talk about mainframe capacity in MIPS, or uh, millions of instructions per second. Uh, but that's changed. Now people talk about MSUs, or millions of service units. And these MSUs are used to come up with a monthly license charge. And the idea is to have enough capacity on the machine to more than meet your needs for the system, but only pay for the capacity that you use. Hence the whole idea of trying to keep that rolling four-hour average lower for the month and effectively come up with ways to lower your monthly costs on the mainframe. It's one of the few platforms that embraces this model, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to uh, buy more capacity that you need than you need currently but plan ahead and then use the capacity going forward and only really pay for what you're using. This costing model, however, means that you have to really understand your environment to save money. You not only have to understand the resources that are being used, but how they're being used, when they're being used, whether schedules have to be at the times they're at, how important these schedules are to your business. All of a sudden, you need a lot of experts to help run your mainframe efficiently and control your monthly costs. And that's this urgency to drive what we call mainframe modernization. Mainframes are a significant business cost for many businesses, and if they are unmanaged, that means that you're basically paying for a lot of services that you may not need depending on how you can uh, restructure and understand your environment. At RSD, we had a recent survey of our mainframe customers, and our respondents indicated that up to 15% of their mainframe applications are actually being used for non-critical uh, resources, non-critical jobs. And we see that as uh, wasted resources and a lost opportunity. Uh, there are advantages to running certain applications in the mainframe, Co-location can cause some convenience, but if you can really keep the mainframe for your uh, business critical, mission critical workloads and uh, offload other workloads to other platforms to complement the mainframe, we think there's a significant cost savings. And all businesses want to move in this direction to move to uh, everything being digital, everything being online. But how you take these actions moving forward, how you do your modernization, how you're informed about it is what really makes the difference. So our 
key recommendations are shown on this slide. And the first thing to do is just begin with alignment and assessment. Understand what's running, when it's running, why it's running at that time. And understand the actual application portfolio. Make sure it's really important to your business that it's running where it has to and the priorities are aligned specifically. Identify if there's any alignment in the application workload processing with the needs of the business. Is this being scheduled at the right time so you have all the information you need to make business decisions? Is the capacity mapping out well with your uh, workload, with your day? Are all your SLAs being met? And then just optimizing this processing going forward, being able to identify the opportunities where you can move workloads around or maybe uh, identify a peak but another low in a different area and come up with savings and prioritize what's going to work. But ultimately, what's going to happen is you have to have a partnership between your IT people and your business people. You have to involve and engage all your stakeholders early and often because this is not a static decision. This is not a one and done. This has to be done over and over and over again. It's a dynamic, it's, it's a living, it's a synergy that has to be built. You have to engage your business stakeholders and your IT people early and often. And all processing has to be done with the organization in mind so you can get the best results. So we just basically like a work once repeat, just do this process over and over and over again. When you think you're done, it's time to start again. But to finish with this portion of the um, presentation, if we now have a strategy and we have a tactic where well, we have to go forward with fact-based decisions. You have to categorize all your applications, whether they may be how they're useful and helpful. Think strategically about the alignment of everything that's on your system. Come up with an assessment phase where you identify your peak consumption, your windows of time, and know which critical workloads are in the picture and how they're working with other workloads that are there as well. And have regular meetings and optimization initiatives. Engage anyone and everyone that has a stake in this environment so that they don't feel left out and they want to contribute so you can fully understand what's happening. Once you have all this in place, now have what you need to do a step-by-step -step approach to uh, optimize and modernize your uh, mainframe. And at this point, I'm going to hand off to Craig to go forward. Thanks, Mark. And I'd encourage uh, everyone, just as a reminder, uh, if you have questions as we go through um, the presentation, as we have this discussion, be sure and submit your questions um, as indicated earlier, and we'll get to those in just a few minutes. Um, so one of the things that Mark mentioned, um, very important to think about this strategy. And as you utilize this framework that we're talking about, these recommendations, there are some things to consider. And this first step, really, the, the, the items in it really are strategic in nature, if you would. They're really strategic for the organization and for any modernization initiative that you want to take on. Mark mentioned briefly an alignment and categorization of applications really being beneficial to clearly align the applications with business strategies and business plans, kind of a rationalization of the applications, if you will, as well as categorizing the applications so that they reflect the actual structure of the organization. For example, you might want to group uh, applications and make sure they're grouped together by lines of business or entities or whatever the structure of the organization is so that it makes sense and it's very clearly aligned how the application portfolio supports specific segments of the business. In the assessment phase, the focus is on how applications that support those specific business functions actually impact peak consumption. That's what we're really talking about is monitoring, understanding the peak consumption, and making a difference in that peak consumption so that IT costs are brought down and you can use those savings for other IT initiatives. Then finally, in the tactical, what we want to talk about and really focus on, focus on these optimization initiatives are really about engagement, 
with stakeholders, and they need to be active and tactical uh, items. Optimization is really acting on specific opportunities to affect a change. And there you want to focus on optimizing the mainframe for efficiency, and that's what we'll get into a little bit more. And then finally, initiating and strengthening the IT and business partnership by keeping stakeholders engaged and informed. I recently was able to attend uh, some other uh, business sessions. It was really interesting how so many of those sessions focused on uh, kind of trying to fix the partnership between IT and business and strengthen those conversations and thereby strengthening uh, decision making. What I'd like to do now is break this out and expand on each recommended step. So first, step one, you need to know and understand the application and the workload and its impact on consumption peak processing. Conversation after conversation that we have with industry experts and customers emphasizes the importance of understanding MSU consumption. If you know the peak consumption, and you, you know what contributes to that peak, you can implement specific actions to lower and normalize those peak as, peaks as much as possible. You have to ask yourself some questions. Are there opportunities to reduce consumption by considering placement of workload on specific systems and analysis of SLA commitments or even detailed analysis of batch windows, things that are operating in those batch windows that are directly contributing to the peak and small changes that can be made. Can specific applications or workloads be optimized to reduce impact on the peak? All of these may be opportunities to contrib contribute to specific savings. This slide really is about optimization and uh, what I said earlier about being tactical. These are as specific actions, so you want to take action. Can you reschedule non-critical workloads um, so that uh, they will have direct impact on the peak? If you're processing non-critical workload in the peak or near the peak and contributing to the peak, you know, why is that happening? Can you do use another strategy? Perhaps you want to identify specific non-critical workloads or applications that are candidates for migration off platform to other platforms. They're not using something that is specifically needed in the mainframe. Um, they may be a candidate for migrating. Um, you know, you need to consider, though, that even just moving them out of the peak and as far away from the peak as you can, so basically what we call free MSU, it may be more cost effective than migration. You can implement scheduling changes. I'm an example of one customer that noticed backups were a precursor to their off-hours batch processing, which is where their peak was, it, all they did was basically move that backup period to an earlier time, and it significantly reduced their R4H peak, therefore, therefore you know, reducing their billing, their monthly billing. You can also identify and track abnormal processing. I'm actually excited to be able to share this sometimes with people because they're not aware of it. Most licensing agreements include provisions to exclude abnormal processing from MLC if you can identify and document it with your monthly reporting. So every month when you submit the reporting required for the billing, if you have abnormal processing, something that went into a loop or a new process that was implemented and, you know, you, uh, maybe the testing wasn't, uh, you know, didn't, there were some unexpected things, uh, if you can document that with your monthly reporting, it will be excluded from your billing. And these are provisions that are in most agreements, and a lot of people just don't realize it, but they can take advantage of that. And then finally, analyze trends to leverage your negotiating position in contract renewal discussions. We have some interesting uh, uh, feedback from customers as well that when they're using some of these strategies, that they're actually getting the procurement people involved in these conversations as well to provide information to them so that they have a uh, advantageous negotiating position with contract renewal discussions.
And then finally, one of the last things that we talked about was this IT business partnership. We encourage you to engage all stakeholders and keep them involved. Um, use just-in-time data. You know, sometimes we use the term real-time. I prefer the term just-in-time data to provide understandable and meaningful data for IT and your business stakeholders. Provide some basic common metrics and presentation information to facilitate discussions and decision-making that can have common discussions. And you really need to make sure that um, you're using things that are based on analytics, the analytics model. Um, the definition of analytics is the discovery and communication of meaningful patterns and data, the application of statistics favoring data visualization. I think that's a perfect uh, example or definition for analytics. And if you're using this analytics model, then therefore you can interact with data and dive deep, deeper for filtering and additional analysis. And that's what, you, what needs to be one of your goals. Recommendations that we would make regarding um, key solution architecture and capabilities for tools that you might be looking at to help you uh, drive these modernization initiatives and really focus on the consumption model that we've been talking about so that you can make a difference and make a significant change in the cost of your mainframe and free up that IT budget for other um, innovations. Uh, really are just a really few small handful of some uh, really uh, capabilities and features of some of these tools. Really needs to have some automation. So autom automation capabilities for reporting um, should not contribute to MSU consumption. You want to look for something that is not going to increase MSU consumption because after all, that's the idea. We want to cha make a change in the consumption so that we can directly impact it. You want to be able to easily map applications and workloads uh, based on the organizational model. Earlier when I was talking about the alignment with the business structure, you want to be able to do easily easy mapping so that it makes a lot of sense and falls in line uh, with the alignment to the business model and the organizational model. You want to be able to interact with the data, so interactive for dynamic analysis of the data, and then also think about scalability so that you can support ingestions of uh, fairly large amounts of data. System data seems to seem, tends to be very verbose, and you want to be able to ingest large amounts of that data so that you can see trends and historical markers. We like to ask some key questions uh, to really kind of get people thinking about some things uh, when it's related to a tool and uh, or some uh, strategies that they might want to put in place. Um, so really think about how much time is needed to produce the required and valuable reporting for the organization. Um, if you're using chargeback and if that's um, one of the goals of an initiative like this, um, you know, is the data used accurate and does it really reflect uh, consumption in uh, on the uh, MSU consumption? Because th that is the really true IT cost. Uh, sometimes people miss the point there and it uh, affects IT budgets negatively. And then uh, does your company have a strategy for mainframe optimization and how are you making it happen? What are the things that you have in place today and where could you use utilize this framework to kind of shore up some things? And with that, I think we'd like to open it up for some questions. Um, perhaps we could ask if there are any questions from uh, the audience at this time. We can uh, see those in the chat. Mark, do you want to address uh, mainframe and cloud? 
Or do you want me to take a stab at it? Right here. The question is, are there benefits to move mainframe to the cloud? How mainframe servers are moving to the cloud, and what is the best cloud provider for the mainframe server? Okay. Uh, take a stab at this. Cloud is basically a model for off-premises uh, or controlled premises processing. Uh, usually, uh, the products themselves are offered in a certain container or a packaging format, and the intent is for you to pay for the amount of processing that's being done in this cloud environment for your uh, company. Uh, the cloud service offerings that I've seen for uh, mainframe have been offered by IBM at this time. I am not familiar with the other offerings. I know there are some other ones out there. And I have not actually seen how the billing processing is being done yet in that environment. I assume yeah, that I as think. all uh, organizations take some limited moves into the cloud that the uh, ZOS will become part of that. I know that IBM uh, is looking at some new pricing models, what they call co um, container pricing. Uh, ZOS, the cloud services, to try and meet that need. And I think that the uh, optimization that we're talking about is going to be applicable in that environment as well. Even yeah, that's what I was just getting ready to say. I don't think that a movement to whether or not you have it internally or it is, uh, you know, hosted externally, uh, if that really changes uh, what you want to do as far as optimization, you still want to be running in the most optimized environment. Um, the cloud agreements tend to be longer-term agreements, so you're kind of locked into things. Um, but Obviously, I mean, with any agreement, if you can do an optimization opportunity and you are tracking your consumption yourself, and then you can go back and say, okay, this is where we are today, as opposed to, you know, this is where we were, um, I, you know, it would be a hard, uh, <laughs> hard thing for a vendor, you know, to say, well, we don't want to have that discussion with you right now. Um, I mean, and if nothing else, then you know what your position is when you uh, when that con agreement comes up for negotiations again. And even though you're on a ZOS cloud environment, the monthly licensing charge has to be worked into that agreement somehow. So you're right. still going to be looking at it monthly, and you're still going to be dealing with your workload in that environment. So even though your right. processing is being done elsewhere, the same uh, modernization uh, – disciplines that we talked about are still applicable. You still want to tune that workload. You still want to optimize that workload and modernize it and make sure that things are running at an optimal time for an optimal reason. Right. I would have a lot of questions in an agreement like that, like, well, you know, what is being used for capping? How is capping being done? Because you know that at some point in time that will be part of the equation, um, and you, you really have to ask yourself, okay, is capping being done? How is it being done? Uh, how will that affect my SLAs? How will it affect other services? Uh, because uh, one of the things that Mark, Mark mentioned early on in the uh, presentation was that capping tends to be kind of inorganic. And by that we mean, you know, you just place this false ceiling, if you would, trying to control cost, but it really has nothing to do with the dynamic uh, nature of the infrastructure and the processing itself. I mean, your processing a lot of times peaks in processing are related to a lot of things that could even be related to changes in the business. And an important thing to understand, to complement that in the cloud environment, is that there are, usually there's a lot of uh, wording, processing, contractual agreements about the actual response time of that cloud environment. A lot of times uh, throughput, may not be the strong point of a cloud environment, the redundancy and the availability may be. And with a mainframe cloud, that's probably a little more sensitive as well. So there's a wealth of tools to optimize that environment. But depending on how you've got your uh, agreement for uh, ZOS cloud worded, you may not have as many options as you do if you were hosting the workload yourself. 
So there was another question, isn't cloud a much less costly model? Um, well, I think it depends on what kind of agreement. I mean, these, uh, uh, cloud agreements are as varied as other agreements, uh, so it's all about licensing. Um, so an interesting uh, business session that I was able to attend back in December, um, that um, all of those technical sessions were about cloud, and what was interesting, every one of the sessions uh, had very specific cautions about moving to the cloud. They kind of had actually, I don't want to call them horror stories, but stories about people making decisions about uh, moving a bunch of things to the cloud, thinking that they would be, you know, a cost savings. And over time, as they ramped things up and, you know, they moved into different tiers, if you would, uh, with their cloud provider, they started asking the question about what happened to my cloud bill? Why is it suddenly more? Um, there are all kinds of um, things to consider when going to cloud. You know, what is the best strategy? Is it a good idea to move everything to cloud? Uh, uh, you know, um, different capabilities for infrastructure now are available many, many different pricing models as well. So one of the things about monitoring consumption and knowing and understanding your consumption is it will impact capacity planning, it will impact performance planning, and it will also impact infrastructure planning as far as uh, processors and things like that that you're going after. Um, because you're, you're coming from a position of knowledge so that you can make some better decisions about those acquisitions as well. And then you can also, if you know your consumption, you can also take advantage of other pricing models that you may not, you know, you may not have in place today. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that goes in, go into the whole discussion, and I would consider all of those along with the cloud discussion, frankly. And, you, and traditionally, uh, cloud tends to be very cost effective if you find a solution that you have to tailor very little you can pretty much go with the product as it is delivered off the shelf. So the more business optimizations, the more customization, the more uh, unique facets that you have to your uh, industry solution, the more costly cloud becomes just because you're not fitting into the off-the-shelf mode. Right. There's another question, what are important factors to consider when evaluating a mainframe migration? And how long does a typical migration take? I don't know whether or not the question is really related to moving to the cloud and what you know what it would take to actually do that, move the data, move all your processing, do all the testing. Um, I would say it really depends on the size of the environment. Um, I, I have a lot of conversations with customers and people that are doing different things and have gone down different paths for strategies. I just had a conversation uh, earlier this week with an organization that was has been talking about entire mainframe migration where they're trying to move everything off of the mainframe and they readjusted their timeline. Um, they just readjusted it again for the second time and pushed it further out. So I, I think it just depends. I'm not here to say that, you know, every organization is different and you, you just need to do a lot of research and ask a lot of questions, I would say that you want as much information about what's really going on in your environment as possible. And that's why we talk about this framework so that you understand how everything is aligned to the business and the application portfolio is aligned to the business and then also uh, really understanding once that alignment, once you've got a good alignment and you feel comfortable with that, what is really contributing directly to peak consumption because that is where all the cost is. Uh, I would also hasten to say that uh, one of the things that's interesting is uh, some of the research that I've been reading recently has to do with IT budgets and the idea that um, IT budgets so much of the time are really about processing, right? If, if oh, if this application is, reduces the processing, then what we charge back to the business that's responsible for this application or the, uh, even if there's not formal chargeback, there's some kind of, you know, accounting system on the, um, or accounting process on the systems to account for that. Uh, but the problem is that they're looking at processing, total processing, and they're not looking at consumption, what that application really actually contributes to the peak consumption. 
And so what it does is it creates a deficit in the IT budget. So it's actually putting more pressure on the IT budget, right, because uh, processing has gone down, but their overall consumption has not gone down. So therefore, their cost has not gone, gone down. So you're, it's a kind of an artificial um, savings. It's not sa real savings at all. And what I would say is really focus on consumption. And actually, we have some questions to kind of promote uh, discussion as well. I'd like to jump into some of those. Maybe uh, it would help people, um, you know, think about some things. And maybe they would have some other questions. Uh, one of them is, how are you monitoring your mainframe consumption? You know, do you have tools in place, and are you really monitoring consumption, not processing? Because that's why we kind of made the distinction early on about MIPS and MSU, because they are different. Um, and what what initiatives um, do you have ongoing now to optimize the cost, that the actual consumption? On your mainframe, you know, how's that going? What what things are you doing today, and how are those going? Um, another question that we have is, um, how do you communicate with your business stakeholders and engage with them to align the mainframe resources and have this uh, discussion about consumption, the actual consumption and the cost associated with it? Yeah, I think that question uh, in particular we talk about uh, communication and collaboration across all the stakeholders. I, uh, Craig probably will, will agree with this, but uh, the more informed the people are that are part of your organization as to what the real cost is of the processing and how it's being done, I think the more engaged they become and the more meaningful conversations you're going to have. The, I think the worst thing that people can do is just go into a back room with five people and come out and say, and here's your charge, and not listen to the um, people that actually own the applications and take into account how they feel they're being charged, you know, what's being done, and not having uh, the advantage of seeing what they're using to measure their resources. Right. And I would say one of the other things about that is you talked about going into a room and making a decision. The other decisions a lot of times that come out of those discussions are, okay, these are the cuts that we're going to make, right? And um, this is how we're going to hold the line on the cost. Um, and there's really no collaboration involved, first of all. And then the other thing that's interesting about that is that there's this law of diminishing returns. You can only do that so many times, and you're really not making a difference after a while. With the law of diminishing return, you really need to seek new alternatives to reduce these costs, and that's why we're really talking about and I think that's why the conversation has changed over the last two to three years, where it's all about consumption. You've got to know and understand your consumption. And to me, the only way you can really understand that effectively or make an effective change is that alignment with the business itself. Uh, yeah, the more, I, th I personally believe the more involved people are in the decision making process, the more informed that they feel, the more they feel they can make a difference, the more engaged and uh, happier they're going to be with the end result and with the process. I think that's going to be critical going forward. More and more people want to be involved. They may not have as much of a, um, a stake in the entire process as another person, but they want to have their uh, their position known. There was a, one more question. How is security handled with respect to mainframe, given many corporations are moving more applications into public or private or hybrid model? Um, I guess the question really is about, you know, what are, how are they managing risk associated with it? Um, you know, we hear this conversation a lot as well. You know, we are a uh, – we're involved in global discussions really – so GDPR comes into some of those discussions. Uh, certainly HIPAA comes into those mm -hmm. discussions as well. It's kind of an interesting process. Um, so uh, I think that with the growth in the mainframe, one of the things that we talked about is so much of critical corporate data uh, being housed on the mainframe, uh, transactional data, things like that. Uh, and then some of those surveys that we cited where people were saying, well, our mainframe environment is going to kind of remain 
at the same size or will actually grow. I think that's what we're seeing is where the critical data is in that more secure mainframe environment. Uh, I'm not, it'll be interesting to see how the paradigm shifts or if they, we see paradigm shifts going forward as people become more and more secure, uh, concerned about security and security of their data. Um, I know that also obviously cloud providers and you're talking about hybrid models and things like that. Uh, there are all kinds of solutions to, you know, uh, looking at how you're handling your data and which data. So non-critical data, maybe you move it off to uh, a distributed platform or maybe that's a candidate for cloud, right? Um, there are all these uh, things that you can look at. Um, it really is about assessment of the application portfolio and making those critical decisions and trying to decide, you know, what is most secure, what do I have regulatory or other um, uh, compliance concerns, right, with the data, and uh, do I, you know, what I need to do and how do I address those uh, security concerns uh, on the targeted platform. Yeah, I know the mainframe particularly, there's a lot of uh, investment in encryption and in masking fields. Uh, right. That, so that are exposed certain ways. Also, a lot of APIs are being developed so that very small transactions can be built and uh, shipped to the mainframe right. and then sent back. So they minimize the exposure of that data. Uh, mainframe Blocked itself is still the safest place to house it. So blockchain on the mainframe. I mean, all these. Yep. All these paradigms that are innovative things that people think about uh, being innovative and not necessarily on what I don't really like the term legacy because, I mean, what does legacy really mean when every operating system we have available right now has been around for 20 plus years? I guess everything's legacy at this point, but um, it, the question becomes, I mean, would the innovative things are available across these platforms. Uh, to me, it really comes down to uh, fit for purpose, and that's really what we're talking about as well, is understanding your application portfolio, understanding the consumption, <clears throat> seeing how you can make a difference in that consumption model and the cost, therefore, <clears throat> and free up to do some of these other innovative things that you want to do, regardless of where they are within IT, right? It's all about freeing up IT budget so that IT can fund other things that the business needs and wants to accomplish. It's up to the IT to minimize the exposures in a public system, you know, and, and uh, leverage as much as they can, making the data secure in a private system. Just because an application is hosted on one platform doesn't mean that security is lacks other places. You have to be tied everywhere. Right. <clears throat> Good point. Are there other questions? We kind of wrap up. Well, we have a, a last question in our, our set of questions is where do you see your mainframe going in 2019? Uh, we still see growth in the mainframe world. A lot of it is uh, going to different places like the ZOS cloud now, which wasn't there before. And a lot of uh, Changes for security, for encryption, for transaction processing are still happening. Uh, it's an exciting, a lot of innovation, a lot of investment in uh, mainframe technology, which makes this exercise and modernization even more important. I guess there was one more question. What is the user experience like post-migration? Oh. <laughs> Wait, there was another question. I, I think one of the things about user experiences, I, I mean, when you talk about end users, uh, most mainframe applications, I, I mean, I'm not, I haven't seen one in a long time that does not have some kind of API or web interface. I, I think from the end user perspective, a lot of this would kind of be, if I can use the term agnostic to end users, they, uh, they might not even know where it's being. <laughs> Posted, quite frankly. <clears throat> we have a final question on developing the talent 
and bridge the skill gaps with regards to mainframes. Uh, it's true that a lot of the um, traditional mainframe skills are uh, people who know them are being challenged, but the newer environments now, especially for development, for agile development, et cetera, they have mainframe tools that plug into the same uh, tool suites that are used for the other systems. So industry-wide mainframe development is sort of joining the fold. So hopefully the, um, the skill gap will shrink. Yeah, I think the other thing is uh, tool selection. One of the things that we tried to share was uh, some things about uh, targeted, uh, you know, functionality and requirements and specifications that you might want to look for in some tools to help you uh, with consumption and monitoring. Uh, some of the things that we talked about, um, there are tools available that, you know, do these things uh, very closely, close to out of the box. Uh, vendors are really aware of this uh, skill gap and they're working to provide things that are uh, kind of pre-built, uh, a little bit easier to implement, um, and, and you know, have presentation layers that really, you don't need specific IT expertise uh, to use them, which is nice. That's one of the things that when I talked about analytics, uh, following the analytics model, it's really about visualization of the data. That's one of the things that analytics focuses on. And I would say that um, that's kind of where some people, uh, there have been some gaps, but uh, those gaps are, are closing rapidly where there are uh, things available um, to do that out of the box. We had another question came in that talked about what type of business apps are on the mainframe. Uh, a lot of financial insurance, uh, banking transaction, monthly statement processing, uh, ATM transactions are traditionally uh, in a kicks environment in the mainframe world. Uh, large inventory, the manufacturing. Uh, Craig, you want to add to that? Or if I hit the main ones? Yeah, I think it depends on the environment. I mean, uh, I'm certainly aware of organizations that have almost their entire application portfolio that's running on the mainframe, and then others that have a what I would really call a true hybrid model, where they've got um, uh, some of their key financial and transactional applications running on the mainframe, and then other things that support the business are off, uh, you know, in distributed environments. That's the last question that I see. And I think we've run right up against our time, so. So back to the Argyle folks. All right. Thank yep. you to Craig and Mark for that insightful discussion. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for a fantastic virtual event and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>